Now we're gonna talk about carb counting and meal planning. It is much easier than you think. Watch. Cool. Now, if you've been paying attention up until now, you probably got a lot about what carb counting is about. Because when we counted, when we calculated the insulin to carb ratio, we were actually talking about counting carbs, or that was the beginning of counting carbs. Two components to the counting carb game, right? And that is, first component is how many grams of carb is in this food? And then, how many units do I take to cover those carbs? One, two, equals three means you got it. There is nothing more complicated to it than that. All right, so let's take it from the top. We'll go through some uh, talking about what carbs are as they differ from protein and fat. In the old days, days of the dinosaur when I first got diagnosed with diabetes, you had what was called an ADA exchange diet, meaning that because you took some regular insulin and you took some NPH insulin, and you took them and they behaved like robots, you had to have a meal plan that matched the insulin. And they were both connected lockstep, meaning I had to eat about the same amount of food on a daily basis because I was taking about the same amount of insulin on a daily basis. Now, even in the old days, if you really knew what you were doing, you were already doing insulin to carb ratio stuff. And like there was always times when my parents figured out that if I wanted to have more carbs, I should take more insulin. It's a game that we play having diabetes and managing it. You want to have the right amount of food. Now, I could teach you there's no one food over another that's better or worse. If you are sort of of a religion that believes that in order to get to heaven, you have to have eight Big Macs a day, I could teach you how to do that. So the other things that we need to think about <laughs> as we're sort of looking historically at how things were, and we're talking now about the world of carb counting is Two things that go into carb counting and eating is number one, your family values regarding food. So like I said, if you want eight Big Macs a day, I could teach you diabetes wise how to manage that and take your insulin for that. If you were just a family of, um, you liked um, raw vegetables and fruit strips, and that was your diet, I might argue with you that that wouldn't be the best way to do it, but I could teach you how to manage that diabetes-wise. So the things that we need to think about when we're talking about carb counting or meal planning, and it's much more flexible than it used to be, but I'll make a point. If you really knew what you were doing in the old days, it was just as flexible, meaning nothing really new has been that discovered. We just call it by different names, all right? But the two variables that we need to think about is one, or the two factors that go into sort of meal planning is one, your family values around food, which has nothing to do with diabetes, right? It just has to do with either healthy or unhealthy eating and how to manage it diabetes wise. Again, I'll tell you that no matter what your values are about food, I can teach you how to do it from a diabetes perspective. All right, so I'm not, as I'm talking about food here, saying good or bad or making any value judgments about any kind of approach. I'm just saying, this is how you do it based on your values. This is how you'll use, this is what you'll use to get to where you want to get to. So when we talk about carb counting, we usually think in terms of exchanges. Now exchanges was the meal planning thing that you used to get from the American Diabetes Association or 
the Canadian Diabetes Association or Australia, Diabetes Australia, where they would tell you, all right, Joe, you have to have 1,800 calories. You have to have 1,800 calories per day. And you have to have these number of calories at breakfast, these number at lunch, these number at dinner. This is your snacks. And that was how you had to do it because you had that insulin that was going like that. And usually the breakup in terms of the nutrients that food is made up, there are three basic food groups. There's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And usually in a diet that we're talking about that's healthy, somewhere between 50 to 60% carb, 30 to 20% protein, maybe 10 to 15% fat. These are somewhat flexible, but this is usually how things break down for most of us, all right? When you're carb counting, what we're saying in diabetes today to make it more flexible and easy for you is that, you know what, we don't have to really consider insulin for protein. And we really don't have to consider insulin dosing for fat because if you look at the impact of each one of those food types on blood sugar, carbohydrate makes your blood sugar go like that. Protein makes your blood sugar go like that. And fat really doesn't do anything to your blood sugar at all except maybe slow down the rate of absorption of the protein and the carbohydrates. So where we've come to now is your dietitian will say to you, based on your height and weight and sort of caloric needs, Joey, I want you to have 45 grams of carb at breakfast. And I think you'll be meeting your caloric intake of calories and stuff if you have 60 grams of carb at lunch and if you have 60 grams of carb at dinner we do need some carbs the thing that you need to know is that having diabetes doesn't mean that we're allergic to sugar it means that we don't have insulin in our body and what that means is that we have to we have to eat like anybody else. We just have to compensate with insulin. So again, there's no food that's not okay for a person with diabetes. I hate it when I go to a friend's house and they say, oh, Joe, everybody's getting brownies and ice cream for dessert, but we made you some delicious fruit compote with no sugar added. That for me is an, uh, I'm close to homicide when that happens. It's like, I want to be able to eat what everybody else eats. And that's what this is about, is teaching you guys how to eat what you want to eat. If your parents say to you that you can have 45 grams of carbohydrate by eating a cup and a half of ice cream for breakfast, who might argue with them? They're your parents. You can get those 45 grams in however you want. Or... If your parents say you need to have one slice of bread, which equals 15 grams, you need to have one small banana, which is 15 grams, and you need to have one cup of milk, which is about 12 grams, that sort of gets you to about 45 that the dietitian said you needed. You can have it however you want. That's what we're talking about. The only thing you have to worry about sometimes is a thing called the glycemic index. And what is that? It's a value that talks about and refers to the quickness with which a particular carbohydrate gets into your bloodstream. Now for me, when I look at rice, it has a very high glycemic index. All I have to do is look at rice and my blood sugar goes up. But for an orange that has fiber in it, it doesn't work as quickly as rice. So it has a lower glycemic index. But those are the only things that you have to think about when you're doing your carbs and you're thinking about your insulin dose and that kind of stuff, right? What you wanna think about is the rate at which the carb gets in and 
basically striking some kind of balance between what you love, what your parents say you have to eat, and eating healthily. All right? Now, it's really important to know is this also, is that when we have a day and you're checking your blood sugars, remember we said that you need to do at least four blood sugars per day? Well, I can tell you this, at least before every meal, and really best to see how your insulin to carb ratio is working, is to check an hour and a half to two hours after eating. All right, so I check, Let's say I know that I need my blood sugar before eating is 7.8 or 140. I take four units for my 45 grams. That should land me at 7.8 and 140 after I eat or before I check at lunch. But I want to see how it did here, one and a half to two hours afterwards. Maybe it went really sky high to 10.2, you know, or, uh, you know, 190. And I don't want it to go so high after the meals. So the reason for checking your blood sugar after you eat, which goes hand in hand with the carb counting and the amount of carbs that you have, is that you may, based on your post-meal blood sugar, determine that you need to take a different kind of carbohydrate. Instead of orange juice, you might want to take a whole orange that has the fiber that'll slow the rate of absorption with a lower glycemic index. You may find that even though theoretically it worked out that your insulin to carb ratio was um, four units for 45 grams of carb, you may see that in the, doing the check after the eating, that you might have to tweak that a little bit. That's what we're talking about in terms of getting a sense. Again, the more you check your blood sugar, the more information you have, the easier it'll be to get smoother control and stay within target zone, 80%, 70 to 150, or 3.9 to 8.3. That's where we want to end up. You have a lot of things to play with, Right? But that's basically what carb counting and meal planning is about. The presumption is that if you have 45 grams at breakfast, 60 grams of carb, remember, at lunch, and 60 grams of carb at dinner, that you'll be interspersing that and adding to that all of the vegetables and protein that come with a healthy balanced diet or meal or eating plan or whatever you want to call it that doesn't make you sort of get nuts, all right? Um, putting food in your mouth, right? Now, some vegetables have sugar in them, you know? Eating a lot of protein might have an effect also on your blood sugar. So some vegetables have carbs and some protein. If you eat over six to eight ounces of meat, you might have to take more insulin to cover that. I know when I go to a steakhouse, whatever my amount is that I'm supposed to take for the meal, and I have a big steak and I love steaks, then I have to take more insulin to cover that. And I might not have to take all of that insulin right up front but I'll have to be on top of my game for the next four or five hours to make sure that what I'm giving and what I've given is taking it. You can do whatever you want. It's your diabetes, your body. I will tell you this, it's not like walking a tightrope over Niagara Falls. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that the more mistakes you make, the more you'll learn. The more you'll learn, the more comfortable you get with doing the things that you can do to tailor the general 
principles and guidelines that we've been talking about to suit your needs. That's the whole goal of learning how to manage this thing is for you to have your life, not for you to have my life, right? And the nice thing about diabetes is, is that when you're doing these little changes, do them smartly. Let your parents know, your parents should let your doctors and dietitians and diabetes nurse educators know that you're doing these changes in an attempt to learn how more to be able to manage and manipulate your tools to suit what you want to do. So the worst that could happen is that you'll have a low blood sugar and then you'll have to have some Skittles. That is the worst that could happen. Or your blood sugar goes up a little bit and you take it and correct it with some insulin based on your insulin sensitivity factor. What we've been talking about today in Diabetes Chalk Talk is giving you things and stuff that you can do, tweak it up and down and to make it work for you. So the food thing is really important. Now, the one food that we didn't talk about that really is a bear for everybody in the diabetes world is pizza. And the reason that pizza is such a bear is because, here's that day again, when you eat that pizza, it's got a lot of carbs in it if you're eating, you know, a slice or two. But what it's also got is a lot of fat. And that fat slows down the rate of the carb absorption. So that you may eat your pizza at lunchtime and you take your, let's say, let's say you calculate you need seven units for the amount of pizza that you're eating. What ends up happening a lot of time is that your blood sugar will be going like this. And if you've eaten pizza and you've taken all the seven units at one time, your blood sugar is going to drop because all of that fat is slowing down the rate of absorption. And you've taken seven units and those seven units are kicking in. So what you want to do with pizza is, I usually do it something like this. I take two units up front and then I tell my pump, which is why pumps are really great. I tell my pump, give me the other five units over six hours. And that's how it works for me. Some people say, you know what? They take that seven units and they say, I want three and a half now and three and a half or a 50-50 split of what's called a combo bolus or an extended bolus. All based on the principles that we're talking about. Nothing new here. Just a little bit of a tweak here and there. Pizza's got a lot of fat. Don't want to give all your insulin up front, but you want to cover it over time. All right, let's do that. Let's take some insulin up front, and then we'll give the rest over an extended period of time. It's hard to do that with MDI in terms of multiple daily injections and basal bolus. What you might have to do there is give yourself a little bit of insulin every hour or so over those time. But it's doable. It's up to you how you want to work it. All right? Cool. The other thing that we didn't talk about, and this is not that relevant for kids, but it is relevant for adults that have type 1, is maybe after having it for a long time, you have a little of what's called gastroparesis. And that means that your stomach doesn't empty as quickly as it used to because of some sort of long-term nerve damage. Now, that's what's also nice about the pump. You can work it like a piece of pizza, <laughs> meaning that if it takes a long time for food to get digested, right? Let's say I eat lunch and it doesn't get digested immediately when I eat the food, right? And my blood sugar, if I took all my insulin right up front, would drop and then would eventually go high. What I can do is tell my pump again, you know what? I'll take two and a half units now. And I'd like to take the rest over a longer period of time to help with some of that slower gastric emptying. But that's not something that a lot of kids have to worry about, but I thought I would throw it in just so that you guys have a sense about it. All right, good deal. 
One other aspect about carb counting and meal planning that's really important, and it relates specifically to effective carb counting, because how well you count those carbs will determine how well and how accurate your insulin to carb ratio is. So one aspect of carb counting, at least in the United States and North America and Canada, is reading food labels. There's a little bit of an art to that because they can be tricky. What do I mean? Well, at the top it'll say one serving has, and then a little look under carbohydrates, and it'll say 30 grams. Now you'll think, well, one serving has 30 grams, so I'm having one thing, and that's got 30 grams of carb. Not. Then you have to see each portion contains two servings. Now, if you just thought that it was one serving in this thing that you're eating, you'd only be covering for 30 grams of carbohydrate, and you'd be missing the other 30 grams. So in this thing that you're eating, it has actually 60 grams of carbohydrate, which is going to have a big difference on how much insulin you take to cover those carbs. So that's important when you're reading food labels. Also, you'll see the sort of breakdown of all the major food groups, and um, there may be a thing here that says sugar alcohols. I'm not going to go into that today, but that does have some effect on how you read the carbs. That would be something that you want to talk about with your um, dietitian in terms of how much to include that and how much not to. Usually when I'm doing this, as a rough place, I just sort of stick with the available carbohydrates, unless it's a particular kind of food that has a high sugar alcohol content, and then I don't want to be bolusing for something that's not going to raise my blood sugar up, but that's still considered a sugar, all right? So good to look at either a book called The Calorie King to get a better understanding of that, and also to check with your dietitian about how to calculate for sugar alcohols in your food. But if you don't have access to a dietitian, or if you don't have access to a calorie king or, or a dietitian, then if you just sort of go with the carbohydrates for most foods, this sort of calculation will work. All right? The better you read the food labels, the more accurate your insulin to carb ratio will be, and the more easy it will be for you to, yes, that's what I was going to say, stay in range. 80% of the time. Cool. Bon appetit. Great. So that wraps it up today for the carb counting and meal planning and understanding food labels and the different food groups. The next time we get together, we'll be talking about sick day rule management, sick day rules, managing sick days effectively so that you don't end up in the hospital or do your best to not end up in the hospital, and the use of glucagon.